Oh. Where does the tomato go when you eat it? Where does food go when you eat it? What's the answer? I don't know. It goes, goes in your stomach. That's where food goes. So that's what a stomach's for. That's where food lands when you swallow it. To utilize raw materials that build tissue and supply energy, the human body employs a complex chemical conversion process. Despite frequent abuse, our digestive system routinely performs extraordinary feats of chemistry. Science has found that man must have food which furnishes energy, food to build muscle and other tissues, food to build bones and teeth, and food to provide the elements for growth, keeping the body machine in good working order. On the other hand, because we now produce more food with less work, most of us are overfed and under-exercised. This morning, lesson number seven includes that of the stomach. The stomach. And now, this is a very subtle part of the Christian anatomy when it comes to uh, the scriptural accounts of it, especially in comparison to the heart, which we went over last week. And if you remember last week, we mentioned that the heart is given a nod 800 times or so in Scripture. Uh, stomachos, however, that's the Greek word for stomach, uh, is mentioned one time. Once in the New Testament. You want to know where it is? No. Oh, okay. Uh, we're done. <laughs> 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, Paul writes to a nervous young minister who has obviously allowed his nerves to get the best of him, so he's got some sort of uh, uh, digestive issues. And Paul writes and says, Stop drinking water only, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach, stomachos, and your frequent ailments. It's interesting that it's only used one time. And it's interesting that it's used in that way. You'd think it hardly has anything to do with the spiritual life. Take a little wine. Take a little medicine. You know you got stomach problems, Timothy? Well, it, even though it's only used one time, it's pretty clear in this passage in the way that it's used that God deems it enough to remind us that what we put into our stomach has an effect on our life and ministry. What you put into your stomach what you ingest with your life will have a profound effect on your life and ministry. Yet we never really think too much about our stomach, do we? Until it starts giving us trouble. Until it starts giving us trouble. Let's pray. Father, this morning we're dealing with an issue here that you have given relatively small room to in Scripture until we look at the themes involved in this very idea. And so we pray this morning that you would feed us if we follow the analogy, Lord. We pray that you would nourish our souls with the food that we need to hear this morning that we might grow. We pray that you would nourish our mind, uh, nourish our soul, and nourish our body always with the truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stomachos is only used one time in the New Testament, uh, but there's another word, koilia in the Greek. That can also be translated stomach if you're kind of questioning, well, I think I've heard of stomach being mentioned in a few different passages. That's true. Uh, but everywhere else that it's used there, uh, koilia is a term that's more general in its usage. Uh, it is used 22 times in the New Testament, but it can refer to any organ in the abdomen. So although you'd find it translated as uh, stomach in some instances or belly, uh, depending on your translations, it's mostly, more times than not, koilia is translated as womb. It has nothing to do with the stomach. Uh, even when it's translated as stomach or belly, it tends to be quite unexciting. And Paul quotes a familiar cultural maxim that was floating around in his day to the Corinthians when he writes, 
food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and he puts it in quotes because that was something that people, is just kind of a, a saying, uh, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. So there's no real spiritual insight to be gleaned from that statement. Uh, you might also remember that Jesus made mention of it a couple times when he was explaining to his apostles some very general uh, uh, physiological processes uh, involved in, in human digestion. He goes, what you put into your mouth goes through your stomach, your belly, and then it gets eliminated. <laughs> and I always think that that's really funny because Jesus is giving them a little bit of a lesson on something that's kind of a no-brainer. Like none of the apostles went, wait, what? Can you run that by us again? Do you have any like, you know, charts or anything, some graphs? Like a felt board? I need pictures. No, it's, it's pretty understandable. So whenever uh, even koilea is used in, in the context of stomach or belly, you know, what are we going to glean from this? Well, I think it's important that we cover this issue uh, because uh, koilea or the belly is the only body part we've got that I'm aware of that God accuses us of turning into an idol. And you go, well, I could turn any body part into an idol. Yes, you can, and many do. However, God acknowledges this only one. In Romans chapter 16, verse 18, it says, some people in the church do, in the church, by the way. Okay, so now we're, we're not pointing fingers at the world. God says, some people in the church do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ. God's going, some people don't serve my son. He says, they serve their own koilea. They serve their own belly. They're Christians, sure. They come to church, sure. But they're not serving Christ. They're serving their own belly. That's what it says in Romans 16. But what does it mean? What does it mean when somebody serves their own belly? You know that a person is serving their koilea, belly, when they are appetite-driven rather than truth-driven appetite driven rather than truth driven uh, and there are people like that in the church who have um shall we say allowed their desire for forbidden fruit whatever that may be to become the controlling force of their life all right so for example and this is really the first example in scripture that we have of it uh adam in genesis chapter 3 he allowed his belly to become his God, if you want to call it that, when he allowed his craving for something earthly to become his excuse to forget God and what he had said and binge on it. He's binging on apples and forbidden fruit when God told him not to. Who's his God now? Well, Jehovah is still his creator technically, but he's not the controlling force in his life anymore. The fruit is. And beyond that, if you want to look closely, it's the devil himself. So it's no commendation to the Christian who comes into church and is guided through life by carnal appetites. Their God is their belly. Okay? We do this. We do this. How exactly do we do this? You know, what, like, what does it look like so that I can know if I'm actually making that mistake or not? You know that you are doing this if you've packed your life full of the same delicacies everybody else is glutting themselves on in the world. And you know that you're one who's being indicted in Romans 16 because you go to church. You snack on the things of God in order to, to justify the spiritual weight gain that you accumulate throughout the week while you're out there indulging in worldly things. Please, don't, don't lose what I'm saying in the poetic language. You're sinning, and you know it's sin. You're doing things that you know are forbidden, and then you come into church and carry on as if nothing was wrong. The Apostle Paul identified this as an eating disorder, if you will, in Philippians chapter 3.19 when he wrote, Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Many. This isn't just like some sort of like, you know, one-off sort of, I met a guy who, you know, was an enemy of the cross of Christ and it kind of caught me off guard because I've never seen one of those in church before. They're everywhere. Enemies of the cross of Christ, many of them, whose God is their koilea. Paul calls it. He says their God is their belly. 
Their God is their stomach. Their God is their appetite. They set their minds on earthly things. End of the verse. Now you can tell when someone's God is their belly when they've lost control of their cravings for earthly things. That's it. Okay? Uh, do Christians do that? Yep. Yes. Question is this morning, are you one of them? Okay? Think. Is your mind set on earthly things? Are you craving those things that God forbids? Carnal appetites. Are you after the things of the world? Does your life revolve around what the earth provides for you instead of what God has given? These are questions you might want to ask yourself. Furthermore, are you snacking on religion? Is this your meal or is this just a, a weekend snack? Okay. And we got to uh, come to the table this morning understanding that uh, these life-dominating eating disorders like bulimia, anorexia, obesity, just to name a few, all of them seem to find their spiritual counterpart in the church. And we're going to go through this this morning. You've heard of bulimia nervosa. That's the technical term for bulimia. Um, it's an eating disorder in which, quote, a large quantity of food is consumed in a short period of time then to preserve their appearance, the one who ate it intentionally vomits. And that's uh, called bulimia. Now, uh, it, 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 as I said, this founds, finds its counterpart in the church in the lives of those who uh, their lives are so stuffed with worldliness they can hardly fit Jesus in, but still manage to do so. Okay? Their lives are stuffed with worldliness. And then they come and just try to pack in a slice of Jesus Christ, kind of like the pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving. If you guys, <laughs> I mean, do I need to illustrate this? We all know what this is like. If you're, if you're American, come on. We have Thanksgiving dinner, potatoes and gravy and stuffing and turkey and um, green bean casserole, because that you have to. Okay, and then cranberry sauce. And then... Potatoes and gravy and turkey and stuffing and then potatoes and gravy. And, and by four o'clock in the afternoon, you're like, oh yeah, pumpkin pie. I forgot pumpkin pie. But you can't not have pumpkin pie for crying out loud. It's Thanksgiving. And so what do you do? Oh, I'll, I'll just take a, a little slice. <laughs> and not too much whipped cream. <laughs> and then we manage, don't we? We get it in. And... Unfortunately, without any commentary on how we behave on November 25th or whatever, <laughs> uh, a lot of Christians are, are living their life like this, packing themselves full of the world and then coming to church on Sunday, trying to fit in some Jesus. They're spiritually bulimic, glutting themselves on the world when no one's looking. Okay, they commit secret sins out there. They're ashamed of the appetites they have. They indulge in sexual fantasies or all kinds of other things that they'll never confess, whatever they may be. But then they come to church on Sunday. Why? Because they use the church as the finger down the throat to kind of clear the system and alleviate the guilt and sort of start over for the week. And if you think that that's a graphic illustration and rather unfair, please understand it's not. Far more graphic in God's eyes is what we do when we purge and binge and purge and binge and purge. World church, world church, world church. Back and forth and back and forth. This isn't ideal. This is a, a, an unhealthy appetite that has uh, very adverse side effects and is uh, actually life-threatening, just so we know. What are the results of it? From healthline.com, it says that the results are because an individual has to keep secrets, it contributes to the cycle of stress and anxiety. Over time, guilt can build up from keeping secrets from your friends, loved ones, and pause. How often does this happen? People in church who got to keep up appearances here, got to look slim and fit and trim, and, but they're doing this out there, and they can't let any of us know. Oh, that would be the end of the world. 
because we could kill them. Like your sin won't. Uh, well, we don't want anybody to find out. And so what do we do? Well, we keep it a secret. Be interesting to find out how many Christians today are living with secret sins that will eventually kill them coming every weekend to an environment where they could be dealt with appropriately by loving caregivers that will help them deal with these issues, but they won't say anything and ultimately perish for fear, guilt, and embarrassment. Unpause. Accompanied by feelings of embarrassment and shame, suicidal behavior may form as a culmination of the stress and the unhealthy body image, end quote. Is that you? Got to ask a question. Because I wouldn't know. Like, if this is secret stuff, then I wouldn't know if it's secret stuff. If none of us in this room knows that you have secret stuff going on, then none of us in this room can help you in a healthy way. So I have to ask this morning, is that you? Is it? Are you unable to control your appetite and keep yourself from secretly feasting on sin when no one's around to see it? And then growing thick with feelings of guilt for it and then using religion to try and purge it. Oh, that life will never satisfy you, just so you know. It's the worst of both worlds because church can't satisfy you when you live like that, nor will the world ever satisfy you while you're, you're trying to play both sides, right? Micah chapter 6, verse 14 says, you will eat and not be satisfied. That's God's promise to those who play this game. You will eat and not be satisfied. The only way to stop being controlled by your appetite for earthly things, and by the way, we all have them. Worldly things are appealing. I get that. But you don't have to be controlled by them. So, so if that's you and you are controlled by them and you can't stop yourself from indulging, then the only way you need to understand this morning to stop being controlled by those appetites is to, get this, stop being an enemy of the cross of Christ and become its friend. That's the only way out is to become friendly and warm, to embrace the cross of Christ, which is what so repulses the flesh. This is the last thing we want to do. We would rather keep it secret. We would rather avoid it. We would rather sweep things under the rug best we can and still, uh, until, of course, our stomach starts to give us problems and then we have to address the issue whether we like it or not. Okay, so the only way around this is to stop being an enemy of the cross of Christ, become a friend. What does that mean? Like, oh, that's really great, Pastor Justin. Thanks for the help. I don't know what that means. You're speaking way too spiritual. Become an, a friend of the cross of Christ. If I were to divine it, I would say th these are the steps you take in becoming a friend of the cross of Christ. A, you embrace the crucifixive elements of the Christian faith. By the way, crucifixive isn't even a word. I typed it in my notes, red underline. I kept it because it should be a word. We need to embrace all of the crucifixive elements of the Christian faith. If you're going, wait, still too spiritual, I still don't know what that means. Ready? Here it is in plain English. First, you admit the problem you pretend to not have. No more secrets. Then, come to Jesus for the forgiveness you don't deserve. Okay, because none of us does, but he offers it anyway. And then, once acquired, you begin denying yourself the pleasure of sinful living that you crave. So what that you crave it? You don't need to be dominated by it. So what that you crave it? The temptation isn't the sin. The craving isn't the sin. The appetite isn't the sin. It's the indulgence, the being controlled by it. Please understand that, okay? So that's spiritual bulimia. But then there are those on the other side of that coin who, instead of binging on the world, get this, they starve themselves of it. So this would be the counterpart of, of spiritual anorexia, okay? And, and if, if, you, if, you don't, if you don't understand that we've got that going on in the church too, uh, then you might want to be uh, aware of that from this point forward. This is those individuals who believe that nothing should be fun, nothing can be enjoyed, everything should be denied, all flesh is sin, all material is sin, 
everything has to be miserable all the time. And if you're miserable all the time and gloomy all the time and emaciated all the time, then you're really spiritual. The ascetics did that. Ascetics, that's the term that they've coined for these individuals. Um, they pop up all throughout Christian history. These are men and women who would deprive themselves of all sensual pleasure because they, they believed it would make them spiritual. Okay? Uh, you could do a little bit of research online. You'll find that they did all kinds of bizarre things like chaining their own body to rocks. Some of them would eat only grass. Oftentimes, self-starvation for prolonged periods of time was uh, common among them. Some of them would eat only a few beans a day and, and other such silly practices. Uh, there was an Irish nun who carried a stag beetle in her shirt. Just Google stag beetle. And then imagine that guy right there riding in the shirt. She put it in her shirt so that it would chew on her all the time. There's a man named Simeon Stylites, Stylites, I don't know what his name was. Um, this was a man who, to escape as best he could all of the material things and the temptations of the world, uh, s <laughs> I think he built a platform for himself some 50 feet in the air and lived on top of it for about 37 years until he died. Some of the reformers just so that we're equal here, because a lot of us, we like the reformers, a lot of those in the reform camp apparently repeated all 150 psalms daily. I have to do this. It's like, you know what the apostle Paul wrote? I mean, come on. Did si Simeon Stylites ever read what Paul wrote in Colossians? Did that Irish nun ever go, you know what? I'm done with you. Because you know what Paul said in Colossians 2? Hmm. Here's what he said in Colossians 2. Such restrictions indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-prescribed worship, false humility, harsh treatment of the body. But here's what Paul says. But they're worthless against the indulgence of the flesh. So all these people who are trying to keep their flesh in subjection and putting stag beetles in their clothes and all the rest, uh, for all their efforts, get this, all their efforts, people like this are still being controlled by their belly. Even though they won't fill it on the things of the world, their appetite is still calling the shots, isn't it? They recognize they have an appetite, so they deprive themselves of it to an extreme that God never called them to. Just like those in the church who are the bulimics recognize that they have an appetite and refuse to forbid themselves from indulging in them. Either way, whether it's in the positive or the negative, it's the belly that's in control. And so these spiritual anorexics, if you will, have an appetite that's still calling the shots rather than God who, get this, 1 Timothy chapter 6, gives us richly all things to enjoy. Have a ham sandwich on God. Fried chicken and potatoes. Have a slice of pumpkin pie. God said we could. Enjoy it. But don't let these things control your life. Okay? You know that God has the patent on food? Okay? And the patent holder always, with any invention, has a way in mind for his invention to be used for optimum enjoyment. Anyone who buys that invention and wants to use it their own way is certainly allowed to, but it won't produce optimum enjoyment and effectiveness. So it's your call. But when God designed food, he designed it to be used in a certain way, not to be overindulged, not to be underappreciated. Same thing with sex, same thing with music, same thing with playing cards, all kinds of things that people want to turn the tables on in the Christian realm and go, it's sin, can't do that anymore. What says who? You or God? Because if it's God, I'll listen. If it's you, forget it. Forget it. And then the responsibility is on us on how we use the things God has given us richly to enjoy. You decide. But I'll tell you this. Living by godly principles takes discipline. It takes discipline whether the Holy Spirit is telling you to deny yourself of worldly pleasure, which he is, I'll bet, in some. 
you're indulging and the Holy Spirit is telling you to deny yourself of worldly pleasure or, as others may be, inviting you to enjoy material things. But I'll tell you this. When a person's life is colored by what their flesh craves rather than by what the Lord provides, they've made God their belly, whether it's spiritual bulimia or spiritual anorexia. And then there's obesity. And this would be characterized in the church as well as in the physical realm uh, in many cases. Uh, more diet than exercise. Or in some extreme cases, all diet, if you follow, and no exercise. Okay? And uh, I tell you that in the spiritual realm, there are many, and I don't know if this is a uh, disorder, if you will, that's only in Western countries like ours where per, per, uh, Christianity isn't so hotly persecuted. We just glut ourselves on theology and spirituality and all of this, uh, but we don't really do anything with it. You go to a, 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 a community or a, a country where Christianity is hotly persecuted, you can't, you can't afford to do that. You, you can't afford to do that. If you're going to be Christian, you better make good use of it. Okay? No one in underground China really has the luxury of just going to conference after conference after conference and reading devotions in the morning and just ingest, ingest, ingest. They had better make good on their faith. In America, however, we have it all coming out our ears because it's available at every turn. And this can actually be a problem because we can all be Christian and learn it and know it without ever really practicing it. And then we get really spiritually fat. Even the Apostle Paul said, knowledge puffs up. <laughs> Tons of knowledge. Do something with what you know. Do you know to do it, but you still won't? To him, it is sin, it says so clearly in Scripture. James gives us a little bit of health advice when he says, don't be hearers only. Get out there and exercise. Doers of the word. Doers of the word. Don't be hearers only. Don't be all ingestion. Get out there and put to practice the things you have learned. Burn some spiritual calories. So, different issues there uh, concerning the idea of belly idolatry. This is, this is where it can go in the church when people have sort of their belly as the guiding principle in their life uh, rather than the truth of God. They're appetite-driven rather than truth-driven. So I'm going to set that aside for a second here now and talk about uh, another stomach condition that's not uncommon among Christians, unfortunately. Uh, and that is <clears throat> a weak stomach. A weak stomach. Now, what do we mean by a weak stomach? Well, what constitutes a weak stomach in the biblical context is when a person is only able to handle a certain degree of spiritual truth before they start gagging on it. They, 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 there are certain palatable truths in Scripture, uh, the gospel, the elementary gospel, I'll say, um, the introductory parts of Jesus' love for me, them, etc. But anything beyond that, and there's a sort of a gag reflex. And by the way, we all begin our spiritual journey this way, uh, and the Bible even acknowledges that. Uh, we see it also in the natural world, where by design, a baby is, is really meant to be breastfed uh, for the first many months of their life. Okay, And that's by design. God makes no apologies for that, and there's reasons for it. Uh, God made breast milk in a way that it cleanses the baby's digestive tract. That's good. It needs to be. Uh, God designed breast milk in a way that it provides the child with antibodies for good health. That's a plus. Always a plus. Uh, God designed it so that there would be a ready supply from the parent to the child of essential nutrients. Calories, nutrients, minerals, and what have you needed for growth and development. Okay, uh, for your information, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't have known this had I not been a father and, and somewhat involved myself, but within the, the lactating mother community, 
<laughs> breast milk is referred to, if I'm not mistaken, as liquid gold. They understand, people understand, this is good stuff, okay? Babies more than anybody, this is good stuff. So um, the spiritual similarities are uncanny here, okay? Uh, that's why Peter wrote in his letter, um, like newborn babies, he's speaking to new Christians, he goes, like newborn babies, you should crave spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, right? Now that you've tasted God's goodness, crave it like a baby would crave milk. And we're permitted to do that uh, and, and not ridiculed at all for it. Uh, and it would be advisable that we do because that's how we grow. But here's the problem. Breastfeeding is meant to be temporary. <laughs> Let your mind think about that for a minute. It's funny if you think. It's meant to be temporary. And yet some people in the church want to be breastfed their whole life. We see it all the time. I'll give you a case study in the city of Corinth. The Apostle Paul writes a letter to him and he says, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. He says, I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were babies. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food. Why? Because you weren't ready. You weren't ready for anything stronger than milk and you still aren't ready because you're still controlled by your sinful nature. Weak stomach. All they'll tolerate is milk. Anything stronger than that, any deeper truths of Scripture, any further disclosure of the reality of the Christian life, and they all start to barf. It's pretty clear to me that Paul's frustrated, at least a little bit there, like some Holy Spirit frustration he feels towards these Corinthian believers for their immaturity, because apparently we, we get to decide how quick we grow up, at least to a certain extent. Though we are allowed to start on milk, it should only be temporary. And if it remains a perpetual issue and year after year after year, the only thing that we can handle is the gospel truth, the gospel truth, the gospel truth, and no discipleship truth, no martyrdom truth, no reality of suffering and all the rest that people just deafen their ears to. Well, then we've got issues, don't we? So he's frustrated with these guys. Why? Because he expected that they would have grown up and moved beyond the silly sin issues that they were apparently still dealing with. And we know that 1 Corinthians, Paul highlights a whole bunch of silly sin issues that they'd been dealing with for a long time, even after Paul had already addressed them. Issues like they're still being ruled by their emotions. That's one big one in the Corinthian church. They still can't get along with each other, another big one in the Corinthian church. They still want everything the world has to offer and still be a Christian too. We know that was going on in the Corinthian church. They were still using the church itself to promote themselves because they're full of pride. We also know that they were sexual perverts. And so Paul goes, you guys still need to be bottle fed. It's time to grow up. And that begs the question this morning, how long in the Christian life, this is, a, this is an interesting one, how long in the Christian life should breastfeeding be tolerated? Like at what point does Paul, God, the church, me for that matter, at what point is it right to step into somebody's life and go, grow up! You're still struggling with that same issue? You still can't get along with anybody? You're still dominated by your emotions? How long? Where is that cutoff? Because, like, it's all right if I see, a, you know, a year and a half year old baby breastfeeding, but two years, three years, four years, 14 years, 24, you're in college. Leave mom alone. <laughs> like, where's the cutoff? Well, I guess I don't know, but I'll give you some data. The Apostle Paul founded the Corinthian church in 51 AD. Okay? They were coming out of Paganville. These guys were as sinful as can possibly be. The gospel comes to Corinth. Paul shares it. Some get saved. Paul stays there a year and a half discipling them. 
And after 18 months, he moves on to other work. Guess how long it was before he wrote that rebuke? He wrote 1 Corinthians in 53 or 54 AD. That's two, maybe three years. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say maybe four. How long should breastfeeding be tolerated in the church? You tell me. How long did Jesus take to train up those boys to go out into the world and turn it upside down? It took three and a half years. So is there a cutoff? Maybe in God's eyes there is. So if after several years, and I'm, I'm going to limit it to three just for the sake of illustration, if you're still struggling with the same silly sin issues after three years that you had when you came in here, what's gone wrong? What's up? Those of us that have hope for you and prayed for you and invested in you have every right and reason to be concerned and disappointed. Paul was. And if you think I'd be out of line for feeling that way, charge him. I gave you three years and you still can't handle anything but milk. This is a real digestive issue. This is a real disorder in the church, is it not? Weak stomach. Weak stomach. There are so many people with a weak stomach. So many people who come to Jesus for the milk. They want to come to him for a nice drink of something that soothes. Yes? They love to be told the generic news of Jesus Christ, and then they ch choke on what he actually taught. Tell me about who Jesus is and was, not what he said. Deal? I like milkshakes. I don't want meat. So if this church starts to dole out small pieces of steak and potatoes, I'm not, I'm not sure if I really want that because my digestive system hasn't really grown accustomed to solid food right yet. Okay? Jesus is wonderful, and the gospel saves. And we, those sinners, can be forgiven, and we can move into a wonderful brand new life with Christ where everything is new, and everything is different, and everything starts over, and that's good news. And I agree with that. And that's the milk that you need to drink deeply of. But after a few years, you might want to move on to like some of those um, snacky things they make for kids. It's solid food, but it actually dissolves in your mouth. It just kind of fools the kid into starting to learn how to chew. We need a little bit of that. And then we need to gravitate, graduate into um, like grapes. We started with halves of grapes or quarters of grapes. We'd cut them in half and don't choke, you know, and what? Okay. But sooner... Sooner or later, it's steak and potatoes. And what do we mean by that? Well, it's the things that Jesus actually taught. Are you ready for this? I'm going I'm to list a few. So don't choke. The necessity of personal crushing in your life. The demand for humility. No apologies. He demands it. The call to holiness. The reality of martyrdom and its possibility for you. The fact that money and riches make it nearly impossible, if it weren't for God, impossible for you to even go to heaven. The fact that Jesus might intend to ruin your family dynamic if you choose to follow him. The fact that obedience requires self-denial and promises suffering in perhaps large doses. The fact that he gets to define sex and marriage and then he gets to decide whether you even have it or not. You know, stuff like that. Just tell me that Jesus loves me. He loves you. He loves you. Like every steak and potatoes meal needs to be washed down with a little milk, all right? You might be called to be a martyr. Your life, you're going to be crushed. You're suffering. But listen, he loves you. And anybody who ventures into that realm will realize as they march along on the difficult path that there's no greater joy. I'm with Jesus. He's right here next to me. We go through this together. That's the conundrum of the Christian life. It doesn't make sense until you're on the path. So, but if you're not on that path, I can't really take the edge off of the reality of what he's calling you to because it's always going to choke. It's always going to seem difficult. But listen, wash it down with a little milk if you need to. Just 
work on getting your stomach accustomed to the reality of the Christian faith, please. When Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. I don't know if he said it like that. He might have said it like the pictures depict. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. You know, or whatever. Well, however he said it, we can't read tone into the text. But when he said it, make no mistake, he was putting an end to everyone's being spiritually picky about what they get to eat. (laughs) Wouldn't he? He goes, you following me, are you? Okay, there's two things on the menu. Flesh and blood, mine. I'm taking orders. Is any, anyone hungry? And what does it say by the end of the chapter? Many weren't. John 6, verse 66. Many left him and walked with him no more. And they were disciples, by the way. They don't want it. Why? Because they want to be picky. They want to decide what they eat and drink, spiritually speaking. And Jesus says, no, I got two things on the menu. My flesh, my blood. He's saying, you eat what I give you to eat. Whether it nauseates you or not. Whether it offends you or not. Whether you gag on it or not. This is me. Have some. And that's why people left. There was a Frenchman born in 1950 named Michel Lotito. I think that's how you pronounce his name in French. (laughs) Michel Lotito. I, I don't know. Anyway. This man, if you've never heard of him, you may have heard of him without realizing you've heard of him. This is a man who became famous for deliberately consuming indigestible objects. Rubber, steel, glass, things like that. He had an incredibly resilient digestive system with a super thick stomach lining. As a result, he could safely, and that's in quotes, safely consume just about anything. His technique revolved around reducing metal objects into smaller pieces, making them easier for his body to handle by keeping his throat lubricated with mineral oil. In this way, he would regularly eat two pounds of metal every day. Okay. Over the course of his lifetime, (laughs) his diet included 18 bicycles, seven TV sets, two beds, 15 grocery carts, a computer, a coffin, a pair of skis, six chandeliers, and between 1978 and 1980, a Cessna 150. That's an airplane, weighed one and a half tons. Okay? Now here's the irony. You got it. There was a pun in there. Yes! Here's the irony. Bananas would upset his stomach, so he never ate them. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Turn to Hebrews chapter 5 real quick as we close. (laughs) I find it amazing both the amount and the degree of offensive material that we could ingest all week long. Listen to me. The amount and the degree of offensive material that you and I ingest all week long through TV, media, stuff that has no shred of anything spiritually edifying in it. We watch graphic movies with hard language loaded with sex, sexual violence, sexual innuendos, crass humor, godlessness upon godlessness, hour after hour, and then we come to church and get offended by what God says or what the church asks. Right? It's American culture. It's what we do. We pack our gut with junk food all week long, and then we come to church and choke on salad. Right? We eat heaps and heaps of garbage, but we can't handle a banana. Something's wrong with your stomach. If that's you, something's wrong with your stomach. In Hebrews chapter 5, toward the end of the chapter there in verse 12, the writer is chiding the Hebrew people 
in a a relatively strong manner, I believe. He says, by this time, you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you all over again, he says, the first principles of the oracles of God, and you've come to need milk and not solid food. He says, because everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He's a baby. And Peter already pointed that out. And for babies, it's okay to be a baby. To be on a milk-only diet is okay if you're a baby. Uh, But the writer of Hebrews isn't speaking to babies. He's speaking to grown adults that know better. He's speaking to men and women who have been a Christian for a long time and still can't handle meat. He says in verse 14, solid food belongs to those who are full of age. That doesn't mean chronological age. That means age, a.k.a. experience, a.k.a. longevity on the Christian path. You've been down this road. He says, those who by reason of use, okay, diet and exercise, by reason of use, they put to work the things they've learned. They burn the spiritual calories they ingest. Those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. These aren't people who sit in church and go, oh, praise the Lord, that was a great sermon, and then go out and live for the devil. Oh, I want Jesus and I'm following Jesus, and then Monday through Friday, they're chasing carnal things and glutting themselves on what the world offers. And you all know how it works after a Thanksgiving dinner. We blame it on the turkey, you get sleepy. And so many people are out there glutting themselves on the silly things that our culture offers, and then by the time they come in to Sunday morning, oh, so sleepy. How healthy is your stomach this morning? Can it handle solid food? Are you binging and purging on the world? You partake of sins in secret that you know are terrible, and then you come here because you know that you'll get clubbed for it, you know, and, oh, you're a bad person, and and you rather enjoy the meat of the word because it makes you feel terrible, and that's what really, that's the only thing that could alleviate the guilt that you're acquiring out there, and so... You appreciate that you are humbled. Because the pastor is able to do what the Holy Spirit wasn't able to throughout the week. That's tragic. If the only reason you feel better about your sins and feel forgiven is because you got beat up over a sermon, Where is the Holy Spirit in your life? And if you're not responding to the Holy Spirit when you set foot into those areas of sin out there, then what does that say of you and the so-called relationship that you have with God? That says it's non-existent, I'll tell you. It says it's non-existent. Is your diet balanced with exercise? Or is it lopsided? You're becoming an astute theologian. I know my Jesus and I know my Spurgeon. (laughs) John Calvin is my best friend, you know. And that's about it. You're going to get fat. Are you kind of one of those who thinks that you can't enjoy anything in life? Oh, I had too much fun this weekend. I must have something to repent of. Oh, I can't ever buy myself something because that would be ungodly. That is a stark denial of God's goodness in giving you things that were meant for your enjoyment and you're denying him the pleasure of enjoying those things. Sometimes our pleasure brings God pleasure. I don't know if you know that. And it's reciprocated. Sometimes his pleasure fuels my own. Wouldn't it be nice to be in a relationship with God where we're both happy with each other all the time? And did you know that that's offered? He's offering it to you. Well, Proverbs 10, verse 3, I'll leave you with this. 
The Lord will not let the godly go hungry. The Lord will not let the godly go hungry, but he refuses to satisfy the craving of the wicked. He will not do it. If you're trying to find nourishment in areas of sin, if you're trying to sustain a healthy life by indulging in things that you need to keep secret or whatever the case may be, God will not allow you to be satisfied with that. Only in Christ can we find the calories that we need. And he will not let you go hungry if you eat his flesh and drink his blood. He will not let you go hungry. Are you full this morning? That's the bottom line. Are you satisfied? Let's pray. Father, only we can answer that question, I suppose. Uh, nobody knows how full I can get at Thanksgiving, except for me. Only I know this morning whether I'm satisfied in Christ or not. Only I know this morning whether I'm indulging in secret sins out there or not. Only I know this morning if I have a propensity to anorexia or bulimia or obesity or weakness of stomach. Only I know these things, Lord, and you. So may we as individuals take pause and consider the health of our stomach, spiritually speaking. The Apostle Paul, with the only use of that word that we find in the New Testament, stomachos, was encouraging a young Christian pastor to be careful of what he was putting into his stomach or what he was keeping out of it. Because we all know, Lord, that what we ingest in the spiritual realm will have a dramatic effect on our life and ministry. May we be healthy this morning, well-fed, and ready to go. Oh, and by the way, there's sandwiches downstairs. <laughs>